Okay, here's something that will mess with your sense of time. A day on Earth used to be shorter. 1.4 billion years ago, a full day lasted just 18 hours and 41 minutes. That's right, the Earth was literally spinning faster. But why? That comes down to our relationship between the Earth and the Moon. The Moon's gravity pulls on Earth's oceans, creating what we call tides. We see this twice a day, the rise and fall of the sea. But what's actually happening is a lot more powerful than most people realize. As the moon tugs on Earth's oceans, it creates these tidal bulges, massive swells of water that stretch towards the moon. But here's the cool part. The Earth spins faster than the moon orbits. So the tidal bulge doesn't line up perfectly with the moon, it's slightly ahead. That small offset creates a breaking force. And over time, that drag has been slowing down Earth's rotations. And it's been going on non-stop for billions of years. Every century, Earth's day gets about 2 milliseconds longer. That's not something you'd ever notice, but on a geological time scale, it's massive. But here's the wildest part. This slowdown isn't just changing the Earth. It's also pushing the Moon further away. As Earth loses a little bit of rotational energy, that energy doesn't just disappear, it gets transferred to the Moon. That gives the Moon a tiny push sending it about 3.8 centimeters further away every year. Today, the moon orbits us from about 384,000 kilometers out, but back then, it was much closer. The tides were stronger, the pull was fiercer, and that's why the effect of tidal friction was even greater. So yeah, the same force that makes the ocean move is literally reshaping the length of our days and the distance to our moon. Now, imagine living on that early Earth, volcanic, dynamic, covered in oceans, with a day that passed in less than 19 hours. Life back then was just the beginning. Simple organisms floating in the ocean, completely unaware that their planet was slowly hitting the brakes. So what happens next? If this keeps going, and it will, hundreds of millions of years from now, a day on Earth could last over 30 hours. Our planet will keep slowing, the moon will keep drifting, and the cosmic dance that began billions of years ago will go on, subtly reshaping time itself. But right now, when you look up at the moon, it feels so perfect, right? A smooth, glowing sphere, our calm little neighbor in space. But here's the twist. The moon isn't perfectly round. In fact, it's shaped more like a lemon. The birth of the moon was about 4.5 billion years ago, when the early solar system was complete chaos planets crashing, asteroids flying, and then the big one. A planet the size of Mars, we call it Theia, slammed into the young Earth. The collision was so massive, it vaporized chunks of both worlds, launching a ring of molten debris into orbit. And from that fiery mess, the moon was born. At first, it wasn't the calm gray sphere that we know today, it was molten glowing and orbiting Earth way closer than it does now. Back then, the Earth and the Moon were locked in this insane gravitational dance. Earth's gravity was literally stretching the Moon's surface while it was still soft and molten. The result? The Moon got squished and stretched, forming two bulges, one facing the Earth and one on the opposite side. This is what gave the Moon its slightly elongated, lemon-like shape. Not perfectly round, not completely smooth, but forever marked by the Earth's pull. And when the Moon's surface finally cooled and hardened, those bulges, that stretched out shape, was frozen in place. Basically, the Moon solidified mid-stretch. Even now, billions of years later, we can still see that ancient distortion. Scientists even have a name for this permanent stretch. They call it a fossil bulge. It's like a snapshot of the Moon's past, frozen in rock and time. So yeah, the moon we see now isn't just the rock, it's a fossil, a physical record of an ancient gravitational war. Our moon is simply incredible, but there's another moon in our solar system which may take the crown. Way out past everything we know, beyond Mars, beyond Jupiter, even beyond the frozen orbits of Uranus, there's a place where cold isn't just a temperature, it's a reality. Orbiting the blue giant Neptune is a moon called Triton, and it's the coldest known object in the entire solar system. Its surface, 
a staggering minus 391 degrees Fahrenheit. So cold that even nitrogen, the stuff that makes up most of our air, is frozen solid. At that temperature, atoms barely move. It's a world where motion itself almost stops. Now, you'd think that the reason Triton's so cold is because it's so far from the sun, right? Neptune and its moon are over 4.5 billion kilometers from the sun. By the time sunlight gets there, it's less than one thousandth as strong as it is on Earth. But distance alone doesn't explain why Triton is so cold. Because even with that weak sunlight, there's something else going on. When light hits Triton's surface, it doesn't warm it up, it bounces off. Triton is covered in frozen nitrogen, methane and carbon dioxide. And these act like mirrors, reflecting about 70% of the sunlight that hits them. That makes Triton one of the most reflective objects in the solar system, which means almost no heat gets absorbed. The result? Perpetual winter. A world that just never thaws. Imagine a landscape where the ground glitters, but the light brings no warmth. It's beautiful, but utterly deadly. Now here's where things get weird. Triton doesn't even belong to Neptune. It's actually moving the wrong way, orbiting in the opposite direction of Neptune's rotation. That tells us that Triton was probably a captured object, a wanderer from the Kuiper Belt, the icy region beyond Neptune where comets are born. When Neptune's gravity snagged it billions of years ago, Triton spiraled in, heating up from friction and tidal forces, but that heat didn't last. Once its orbit stabilized, Triton cooled and never warmed again. Today, Triton's interior is silent. No magma, no subsurface ocean like Europa's. Its geological activity died out a long time ago. The little heat it once had, gone. Even its atmosphere is barely there. A whisper of nitrogen gas, thinner than a millionth of Earth's air. That means no insulation, no protection, and any warmth that tries to stay just escapes into the endless cold of space. But Triton isn't completely dead. Every now and then, it exhales. Geysers of nitrogen gas erupt from beneath its crust. Tiny pockets of sunlight warm just enough ice for it to sublimate, turning solid nitrogen straight into gas. The result? Massive plumes shooting kilometers into the sky, only for the gas to freeze and snow back down minutes later. A full cycle of chaos in the quietest place imaginable. Triton is the definition of stillness, a frozen relic from the early solar system drifting 4.5 billion kilometers away from the warmth of the sun. And that sun powers everything we do on Earth. It's bright, it's massive, but in a cosmic galaxy with hundreds of billions of stars, our sun doesn't look particularly special. In fact, you could probably call our sun average. Average size, average brightness, a simply average star. But here's the truth. Being average might be exactly what makes it extraordinary. Our sun is huge, about 864,000 miles across, and it holds over 99% of all the mass in our solar system. That's every planet, moon, asteroid, and comet combined, all orbiting around this one blazing sphere of plasma. But out there, amongst its fellow stars, it's pretty normal. Scientists classify stars by size, color, and temperature, and our sun sits right in the middle of that chart. It's what's called a G-type main sequence star, or simply a yellow dwarf star. These yellow dwarf stars make up about 7.5% of the Milky Way stars, common enough to not stand out and rare enough to be just a bit special. They burn hydrogen in their cores, just like the sun does, shining steadily for billions of years. If the sun were much larger, it would burn out faster. It's radiation too intense for life to survive. If it were much smaller, Earth would be just a frozen wasteland. But the sun? Just right. Stable energy, perfect warmth, and a lifespan long enough for complex life to evolve on a tiny blue planet. It's the ultimate Goldilocks star. Not too big, not too small, just right for life. When you look beyond our solar system, you see just how wild the universe gets. There are neutron stars that pack the mass of the sun into a city-sized sphere. White dwarfs, the burnt out remnants of once powerful suns and blue giants that blaze hotter than any furnace we can imagine. In a universe full of extremes, 
chaos, explosion and collapse, our sun stands out for its stability. It's not the biggest, the brightest or the most powerful, but it's exactly what we needed. Amongst the billions of stars, there exists something that breaks almost every law of physics we know. The leftovers from a star's violent death. So dense, so compact, it's beyond human comprehension. This is a neutron star. Just one teaspoon of this stuff would weigh more than a trillion kilograms. That's like squeezing a thousand Great Pyramids of Giza into something smaller than a sugar cube. Let's break down how that's even possible. Every neutron star begins its life with destruction. A giant star, at least eight times the mass of our sun, runs out of fuel. It can't hold itself up anymore, and gravity takes over. The outer layers explode outward in a massive supernova, while the core collapses inward at nearly the speed of light. What's left is a core no wider than a city, about 20 kilometers across, but it still contains twice the mass of the sun. That right there is the birth of a neutron star, one of the most extreme objects in the universe. Normally, atoms are mostly empty space. If an atom were the size of a football stadium, its nucleus would be like a grain of rice in the middle. But in a neutron star, gravity crushes everything so hard that the atoms themselves collapse. The electrons get squeezed into the protons, fusing together to form neutrons. This process destroys the structure of normal matter. All that's left is a solid ocean of neutrons, packed so tightly that there's no space left at all. Now, imagine you could somehow scoop up a teaspoon of this stuff. That tiny scoop, just a few cubic centimeters, would weigh more than a trillion kilograms. That's the same as the weight of every human on Earth times a hundred. And it would crush through the floor, the building, the planet, straight down through the crust like it's nothing. That's how dense neutron star matter really is. Every neutron in that star is jammed right up against the next. There's no empty space, no atomic shells, nothing but pure nuclear matter. On Earth, even our densest element, osmium, has a density of about 22 grams per cubic centimeter. That's pretty heavy, right? Now compare that to neutron star matter. 400 million tons per cubic centimeter. That's like trying to fit Mount Everest into a coffee cup. The gravity of a neutron star is so strong, it bends light, literally warping space and time around it. To escape its surface, it'd have to travel at about 100,000 kilometers per second. And that's why this material stays compressed. If you could somehow take it out of that gravity, it would instantly explode outward in a burst of energy. Neutron stars are like cosmic pressure cookers, matter pushed to its absolute limit. Any denser and the neutrons themselves collapse. And that's when you cross the line into something even more extreme, a black hole. So neutron stars are right on the edge of possibility, a balance between existing and collapsing into oblivion. It's the universe saying, this is far as matter can go before it stops being matter. And the neutron star, it's proof that even death in space can create something truly mind-blowing.